I'm going to do my best so I pray that the Holy Spirit will come and take over even now as I sing.
was it not for grace? If it wasn't for grace, I just want you to begin to think of where you would have been today. If not, for the special grace, the grace that has no border, the grace without boundaries, the grace that is able to empower, the grace that is able to cleanse within. Was it not for that grace? Just imagine where you would have been this morning. But thanks be to God that His grace is able to rule supreme in the lives of the believers. Thank you, my sister. That grace will decorate your life in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I welcome you to church. I welcome to Grace World Christian Fellowship where Jesus reigns and the grace of our God rules supreme. This morning, we are going to explore the word of God. The word of God has power. The word of God can change your life. The word of God can decorate your life. The word of God can change your situation. The word of God is ever faithful. Amen. The word of God. The word of God that is powerful. I want you to bow this morning with me as we go in prayer. Before we go into this series that God has given me for the month of May. It is something that I want you to consider very seriously. Because this is something that infects our lives. This is something that inhabits nations and communities and neighborhoods. This is something that affects churches and individuals. But God is about to do something new in your life, in this church, in our communities, and even in our neighborhood by the special grace of God in the month of May. God has given me a message today that I believe we have so much to do with your life. But before I speak that message, I want you to bow. Merciful Father, what a gracious God you have been all along that even when we are unfaithful, Lord, you have been very faithful. You've watched over us. You have nurtured us. That grace has always cleansed us from within. Father, because of that grace today, I speak. And I ask, oh God, that not me that will be speaking, but you today that will speak to this people. That our lives will remain beautiful in your presence. That we will accomplish that which you have set forth for us to accomplish. As individuals, as families, and as a church, Father, I pray that you grant us the capacity and the ability to reach our redemptive capital and our callings. Thank you because of your grace that speaks favor and mercy and forgiveness and healing. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. The word of God can change your life. The word of God can change your situation. The message that God has given me today for the month of May that I've always talked about, the series we're going to be doing for this month, we are going to be looking at something that affects everyone, something that affects communities, churches, individuals, and something that I believe can change your life and the life of your finances. And my joy is that this is something that Jesus himself initiated. And something that Jesus saw the need and Jesus begins to speak. In this month of May 2013, for the entire duration of this month, we'll be running this series on breaking the spirit of poverty. Maybe some of you do not understand that there is something that has to do with poverty. Poverty is the spirit, is in the mind, 
is something that it can infect your life and inhabit that life. It's something that you don't really want to really associate yourself with. But by the special grace of God, God has given me a word that at the end of this series, lives shall be changed, people's stolen resources shall be restored in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. God is about to do something new in your life, but he wants you first to believe. And for us to start this series this month, I want somebody to join me as we explore Matthew chapter 25. The last two weeks I preached a message, Go for Extra Oil, which was also based on Matthew chapter 25. So we explored the first portion of what we are doing in the month of May. In the month of April, we ran series on salvation, on giving our lives to Jesus Christ, and having a personal, a private encounter with God. And for this month, we are going to be looking at something that is very important for the kingdom of God. Something that has to do with how much we have to do here on earth for the Lord. The Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through chapter 13, we look at the five virgins who were foolish and the other five who were wise. And Jesus begins to speak because he likened them to be like the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom of heaven is something that is practical, is something that is real, is something that people are going to inhabit, and it's something that God is very much interested in you having to share in that beautiful kingdom. But before you share into that kingdom, there's something we have to do first. And that's why God begins to speak. Because financing the work of kingdom needs your money. Financing the work of kingdom needs your resources. Financing this work of the kingdom has got so much to do with how much we do with the resources that God has given to us. And now in verse 15, uh, in verse 14, where I will begin this series, I want you to pay close attention to this conversation that Jesus initiated. Remember that we are still today speaking on the, a series that I've captioned, Breaking the Spirit of Poverty. In Matthew chapter 25, the part one we are doing today is just going to be more of introduction to what we are going to be doing for the next four, five weeks. Matthew chapter 14, in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 14, Jesus begins to speak. And he says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave the first bags of silver, first five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion according to their abilities. Now I want you to take note of that. He said that he divided this silver, these money bags, according to the abilities of each recipient. So then he left for his trip. Verse 16. And the servant who received the five bags of silver, some other version said talent, he said that the one who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. Amen to that. Amen. And then verse 17 says that the servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But then there's something that struck me. But he said that the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and heed the master's money. Mm. Verse 19. After a long time, their master returned from his trip, and he called them to give an account of how they had used his money. Then the servant to whom he had entrusted the five silver bags came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. Amen? Amen. And then verse 21, the master was full of praise. He said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now because you have been faithful, 
I am going to give you even more. Hmm. I'm beginning to like this. I will give you more responsibility. So let's get together and celebrate. Verse 22. And the servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, hmm, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and now I have earned two more. Verse 23, the master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. And the key test where we take our scriptures reading today. Verse 24. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, mm, Master, I knew you were a harsh man. Harvesting crops you didn't plant, and gathering crops you did not cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. Have it. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops that I didn't plant and gather crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. The last portion of that. Then he ordered to take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. He said to those who, who use well worth resources they've been given, even more will be given to them. And then, who will, and, then, and then they will have an abundance, they will have an increase. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away from them. He said, now, throw this useless servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That sounds unlike Jesus Christ. Very judgmental very harsh <laughs> not much grace there but you begin to imagine why Jesus will give this kind of parable why will Jesus talk about this does it mean that the kingdom why would the kingdom of heaven be likened with something that has to do with money I want you to begin to think about it why is Jesus so much interested about monetary matters why is Jesus interested about your finances, your well-being, your health, your career? The career there's something that has to do with your children. Why is Jesus, why does he even care? I mean, we should just separate the spiritual from the worldly. But here was the king of kings likening the kingdom of heaven with something that has to do with material resources. Now, let me tell you this. 95% of what you need to live on planet Earth has to do with money. And now, this will also stroke a whole lot of you. Also, almost about that percentage will also have to do with what you have to do hereafter. In other words, money <laughs> it's important. It's, it's important for you to have it. It's important for you to have talent. It's important for you to have material resources. It's also important what you do with that material resources that God has given to you. And that is why this month we are going to be looking at breaking the spirit of poverty. Poverty is a spirit. It is something that can infect you, infect your life, infect your, your mind, infect your, your wife, your children. It can infect your church. It, it can infect your work environment. Your, it can infect a nation, a community. It is just something that devastates. So we need to break through the spirit of poverty so that God will begin to use us and begin to have us become exactly that which he wants us to be. Why will God, of all people, begin to talk about money? This is something that makes people, folks, very uncomfortable and judge. Why don't we just praise God and go home? Amen to that. Why do we need 
to talk about money, 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 money. Now, let me tell some of you, you will not go far in life if you don't have money. Right? Amen. You will not, in fact, maximize your potentials in life if you don't break through the spirit of poverty. See, some of you may have heard me speak and teach about these things. It's a mission. It's a mandate. It's something that God has given me to do. Part of what we do in this ministry is misempowerment. We want to inspire, empower your spiritual life. We want to empower your material life. We want, you, we want you to be the best that God has created you to be. Because God has created us in his image. The Bible says that he created us. God created us in an image of excellence. God created us in an image so that we can do well in life. We can go to places with God. We can accomplish all the redemptive assignments that God has given us on the planet of the earth. That's why in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, the Bible says that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world and then the end will come. For us to carry the redemptive assignment that God has given us in ministry, money has to exchange hands. That is why TBN is still running 30 something years after. That's why they have not closed shop because they needed to speak. That's why 3ABN, Hope Channel, some of Daystar, you name them, is because this gospel of the kingdom must be preached. Now, if you begin to observe the scriptures in John in Matthew chapter 25, to look at the account of what we have just read, you see that there was somebody there that had a problem with working for the master's money. Maybe someone who was asking God, why do we really need money to do what we got to do? We can just pray, we can sing hymns, we can sing praises, we can just, I mean, there are so much we can do without. But the Bible records that Jesus had a extreme problem with that. And now I'm going to give you a little synopsis of how we got this far in ministry and in life. During the early period of church history, when Christian theology was still being formed, there were so many doctrines that were taught in church, in Christian associations, organizations, that infected and affected what we do today as a body of Christ. In those days, Greek was in power. The Greek world was in power. And because they were in power, they had a final shot. They had a final say. They, 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 they kind of sold their philosophies to the world. Everything that happens in Greek was what should happen in other places. And because Alexander the Great was there, and some of these other great guys that ruled the Greek Empire, the superpower of the then world, things kind of got screwed up. And that is how Neoplatonism get into place and secretly came into church. Neoplatonism is a philosophy or a philosophical system that was so dominant and predominant in the Greek world. And because of Neoplatonism formed by a man we called Plotonis, things begin to happen in the theology of the church. One of the tenets of Neoplatonism is that the material world and the spiritual world are independent of themselves and each one of them are in contradiction. So, you have to separate the material world from the spiritual world. And it's Neoplatonism that will later give us what we call Gnosticism. Because the, the flesh, anything material was evil, and then the spiritual was spiritual. And because of Neoplatonic uh, teachings and Neoplatonic uh, infections that infected the that, that era, the theologians, those who gave us the church fathers, those who gave us what we have today because Neoplatonism infected Christianity to a large degree that so many things were screwed up, were taught in church, and people embraced them. They are now in our literatures, 
as a Christian organization, and sometimes we need to begin to understand where some of these things came from. So Neoplatonic teachings infected the church. It infected theology. It infected what we believe. It infected what the church fathers, people like Augustine Hippo, people like uh, Oregon, and so many other theologians that ruled those wars were affected by Neoplatonic teachings or simply what we call Hellenistic uh, teachings in the Greek. And now, surprisingly, years after, when Greek has fallen and the Roman world was now in power, because these things have been taught repeatedly over the centuries, over the years, nothing changed, my brothers and sisters. And part of the things that was taught was that the material world is evil. Money was not part of the things that should make ministry. Money was not part of church. We need to separate the two. And now you begin to wonder why so many people who will come to church on Tuesday, maybe on Sunday, maybe on Wednesday, maybe on Saturday, will walk away from the corridors of church and you begin to wonder, are these people really church people? Because we now need to separate the two. We don't need to go to work. The work is a work environment. That place is supposed not to be a church or whole environment. So we separated the two in ways where the church needs to stay where it belongs. And then when we finish church, we have finished with God. We have given Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And now it's time for us to give to the community what belongs. So you begin to understand how we got here. So things were twisted up and down. And for so many centuries, so many bad and erroneous teachings were taught in Christian religion and Christian theology. And so many people embrace some of these things. That is why in places where I grew up, Apart from Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, of which I hope you're familiar with, nothing much about money was taught during stewardship. People were not empowered to create wealth. People were not empowered to, to, to acquire wealth because wealth was evil. And now we, over the years, we kind of use that Neoplatonic teaching to justify or to, 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 to harmonize uh, Matthew chapter 19, where Jesus talked about money with the rich young ruler, that he says he needs to sell his possessions. And now, many times I've seen people who use that as a justification that Jesus said, by the way, it is better for, the, uh, for a camel to pass through the eyes of the needle than for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. I hope you're following this because I'm connecting the dots so that you begin to understand why we are doing this and where we are going. Now, let me surprise you. In Jerusalem, in the olden times, you can look, you can search the literatures, they are there. There was actually a gate called the eyes of the needle. And the audience that Jesus was speaking to understood this far better than those who Neoplatonic teachings have infected after Jesus had left, the disciples were no longer there, Christian interpreters, theologians, who, who no longer live in Jesus' time, and who wasn't there when Jesus was teaching these things, now screw things up. There was a place that was called the eyes of the needle. It was a gate. In that gate, which was used majorly in the night, even though many people have disputed it, when the major gate is closed in the city, in the night, that eye of the needle gate has to be opened. It was a small gate that the camels, because they didn't have trucks, they didn't have mark, they didn't have Volvo trucks, they used uh, camels to transport their goods and all that. They didn't have all these nice SUVs, all these trucks you can just use today. They needed to use what they have, and that was camels. In the eye of the needle gate, no camel can pass through that gate unless that camel offload and bend and go on his knees. So in the eye of the needle gate, when the owner of the camel gets there, that owner will unpack all of the loads that the camel was carrying so that the camel can sift in. The camel is a tall animal. I'm sure most of you have seen the camel. It has a long neck, look kind of weird. Amen to that? It's God created. 
And then, that is how the only way the camel can pass through the eye of the gate called the eye of the needle. Now, over the centuries, we thought in church that the eye of the needle, the metaphor that Jesus was using to illustrate what he was teaching, we make it literal. We literalize this. We make it that it is the needle with the thread. And we taught it so much and taught it so much that we stereotype the rich, we stereotype the wealthy guys. It's as if it's not worth going into business transactions. And you can count in those days, thank God that things have changed today, how many folks we had that owned automobiles. Some of you grew up in Africa. How many people in your local church in those days owned automobiles? Maybe you can count just a few of them. Many people had motorbikes, even some folks had bicycles, and even people had none. Now, these, te these teachings affected so many people that so many churches, the leaders of the church, the theologians, the religious leaders and systems perpetrated these teachings so much that people now look at richness, look at wealth with a second look. But let's, let's be honest, church. How many of you will actually reject your next promotion, Ola? How many of you? We said, no, God, I, I don't need this promotion. You know that I don't need it. I am okay by the special grace of God. How many of you will reject the next race that is coming by the time we finish this series this month in the name of Jesus? How many of you are going to be saying, no, no, boss, I'm fine with where I am. Just keep your money. Now, let me ask you another question. How many of you are okay to go homeless by the time we finish this series in the next four or five weeks. How many of you want to stay outside? You don't have a car, you don't have a job, you don't have food, you can't you can access healthcare, your children are sick, you can't take them to the hospital. Hey church, come on, this is not what God wants for your life. God wants your life to be beautiful, but your life on earth will not be so much beautiful without the material resources. Now, the funny thing is that this whole teaching, Neoplatonic teachings I'm telling you, infected the church, infected church teachings and leadership over the years that it become truthful. That if you teach something contrary to this, folks will come question why you have to do this in church. This does not belong in this place. This is not a business meeting. This is not, you know, we, we kind of have all kind of teachings, all kind of wacky things that kind of infected our mind and bind us and put us in captivity not to become what God wants us to be. Now, this month, God wants you to break through. I thought I would have had amen to that. God wants you to break through from this mindset. God wants you to break through from this spirit that inhabits and makes you not... You see, there are so many things that God has given us the grace and thank you once again for that beautiful song that you can accomplish by your own hands, by the special grace of God. God is not a God of poverty. If God was one of those uh, gods of poverty, I'm not sure how much I will serve him. Because even the Bible says that the street of heaven where we are going to walk is paved, somebody say, with gold. And if God, if the street of God, if the street of heaven is paved with gold, wait until you reach the master bedroom. Oh, George. Wait until you get to the living room and see that there is something that is even better than gold that we have not experienced. If the street is littered with gold, he said that the walls are made with jasper. That means that God knows what he was talking about. Now, let me go to this. Let me explain something. I don't want to dabble so much into the history and into how we got here. Over time, as I teach some of these things, by the special grace of God, some of us will begin to... Because what these teachings have actually made in church is for us to have double standards. We have double standards. You know that right within your heart, right within your mind, you need that money to access that healthcare, to send that child to school, to pay that school fees to that child. But something keep holding you back. And that is the spirit of poverty. I've seen people, I had a business partner that once worked to me. He said to me, you know, Pastor John, in the past, actually, 
I used to feel guilty for being rich. I said, oh Lord. I used to feel guilty. I used to be apologetic for my wealth. I said, God, give me the wealth and see what I will do with it. I'm not going to boast about it, but I know that I have no shame. Oh, church, I have, I have nothing to make me, keep me down because God has blessed me. What God is about to do in your life this month is to teach you that there is, there is need for you to create wealth. There is need for you to create something to, 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 to better the life of people. We, we learned this money about injustice, about justice, about all of these things. Church, at the end of the day, what is it that perpetuates most of these things? It's the scarcity of resources. So we see Mugabe, who has been there for 30 something years, if I'm not mistaken, or 20, is it? I think 1980, right? 1983, okay. 1980, okay, that is 33 years now. He's still ruling Zimbabwe. And he has finished the resources of the country. He is just buying stuff from himself. He's so invincible, he's so powerful. Anybody that wants to come, he will crush the opponent. Is that, is that not the spirit of poverty? That is what the spirit of poverty is. Because what happens is that people feel that the more they acquire, the happier they become. It is a spirit that infects people and makes them to feel that it is better to receive than to give. That is not where God wants you to be. Now, in economics, economists, and some of you who studied economics in secondary school, in high school or something, there are some basics we know about scarcity, opportunity costs, scale of preference, all of these terminologies, and, and some of you will understand what I'm talking about, that you, you, you know them when there is scarcity, there, there's no equilibrium. Amen to that? Now, so in economies, we measure wealth and poverty in several ways. And the three most common measures are income. I want you to take note of this. The three first, income, asset. When we say asset, that's where accumulation, accumulated wealth in the form of money, securities, and real estate comes into, into place, and other socioeconomic metrics that we use to look at the lens of poverty. Now, that is something else that I'm going to teach in this series. When we hear poverty, the mind just runs to money. There is more to poverty than money. Amen to that? There is far more to poverty than money. That is why you will, you will discover in this, in this series that there are still people who have acquired wealth, but they are still poor. Something is lacking in them. They are, they, they are still infected with the spirit of poverty, the spirit that binds them and inhabits them that they cannot freely give out. They cannot help even when help is needed. Why would Mugabe still be in power, George? Why would people like Sami Abacha who God knows how many millions. In fact, no, no, there's, there's, Nigeria as a country cannot even say exactly the figure that this man stole from the national treasury. Why did he still remain in power? He was a religious man. In Nigeria, before you are sworn in to any office, there are two things. There's no neutrality. It's either you take the oath with Koran or you take the oath with what? With the Bible. There's no neutrality. You can't avoid that. So these are religious people. They acquired wealth, accumulated so much, but still, people were being oppressed. That is what the spirit of poverty does. Now, so we look at income from asset. What asset do you have? Now, people think uh, we shouldn't be teaching these things in joy, but I'm, I'm doing this so that God's name will be glorified. For poverty, you should, you should have a broader view of what poverty is about. Might have a job now. You're doing your job 40 hours a week, maybe some people over time. But now, what happens when you lose that job? Can you sustain your life in the next six months without a paycheck? If the answer is no, then you're poor. <laughs> that, is, that is the simple. If the answer is no, you need to do something about your finances. You're poor. If, if you wake up on Monday morning and go to office because you had to, there are two things. There are two problems. <laughs> Amen? The first problem is that money is in charge of your life. 
Money controls a significant portion of your life. The second problem is that your boss is in charge of your life. When God was creating us, he created us in ways that our needs for money will be limited. That was exactly how God created you and myself. That your needs for money will be limited. That means you are the one that will control money, not money controlling you. That was exactly the plan of God. But somehow along the line, we get things screwed up. So we measure how much wealth. That's, that's, that's how we know that you have money. That something happens in the next six months, one year, you still live fine, you pay your mortgage, you buy your gas, you run your car, no repositions, you take your children to school, you still have access to your healthcare insurance, your auto insurance is there, still no paycheck. That's how we know that you have begun. So God is beginning to teach me that some of us here, we need to break away from what we have been taught over the years and from what has been keeping us down. Amen to that. So we measure, how do you succeed? That is what Jesus was teaching about in John chapter 25. He said that this rich guy, wealthy guy, he had this excellent servant, perhaps that has served him over the years, and now it was time for him to go on vacation. The Bible didn't tell us how long this vacation was going to last. And now because he trusted these servants, he gave them money. And the one that he gave five, doubled it to ten. That's wealth creation. The one he gave to doubled it into four. But there was one of them that had a big problem. The Bible said that he came as all of these were handing the master, the principal, and the interest. He came back and he said, oh, I know. I know that you're a very, very, very wicked boss. I know that you like to eat where you didn't plan. Here is your money. I was afraid of what you will make out of me. And so I hid your money. The Bible said that he dug a hole and buried it. There are some of us that are still in that category. We are digging holes and burying the talents that Jesus himself had handed over to us. I'm telling you, there are so many of you who are sitting here today who can become powerful, powerful child of God, righteous millionaires, Righteous billionaires. I mean, a people with class, a people of honor. You know what Neoplatonism helped to infect our minds and taught us is that you cannot be rich and still be a child of God. He taught us to believe that you cannot, you cannot meddle with material things and still be a faithful servant of God. But I beg to say that that is not the truth. There are so many people in the Bible. Abraham was one of the wealthiest men in the Bible. The Bible, in fact, tells us that he was called. In fact, to, to, to the glory of God, the principle that will help you to break away from the spirit of poverty is obedience, obeying what God has told you to do. Abraham was one of such a man that God speaks and he had nothing to say other than to, other than to execute. God gave him talent. That's the way I look at it. And he invested in the talent that God has given him. If you read Genesis uh, chapter 16, uh, you will begin to see that Abraham had 318 trained men that worked for him in his household. Now, how many people begin that has 318 households? People that work in his house. It's in the Bible. Look at Genesis chapter, look at Genesis, read chapter 14, where Lord. Uh, was going to hand their sharing and then read chapter 14 to 16. You see that Abraham, Abraham had 318, the Bible said, trained men that walked in his household. 318. No actor on Hollywood has that number. These were just personal assistants, security, and what have you. And, 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 and Abraham was a, a priest, he, he, he was a prophet, he was a child of God, he accomplished so much, that's why we sing Abraham blessings are man. Because God blessed him, God pronounced, God made some serious declarations in his life, and in his offspring, in the life of his offspring, generation descendant. And Abraham was a serious businessman, to the point that he paid his tithe to Melchizedek. Somebody believe that? It's in the Bible. Now, if you don't make money, how can you pay tithe? If you don't make money, how can you pay offering? 
If you don't have, how can you give? Breaking away from the spirit of poverty is the beginning point for every child of God. When I was reading the Matthew account, chapter 25, I, I, begin, I begin to rethink from everything I have thought about money in the past. And God was speaking to me. I said, I have always read this account. I've always read this account. But this time, I begin to look at it seriously. Why will Jesus be so angry? He said, bind him and put him where he will gnash, where he will face, where he will face the heat. High is grace there. But that's what is going to happen to some of us if we fail to make wise of the natural resources and the material resources that God has given us in our custody to use. And now, if you read chapter 30, verse 31, I didn't want to read that place until I get here. He said, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people from the sheep and goats, you know all that. That means part of what God is going to use as his judgment matrix is how you spend the natural resources and the material resources that he provided to you when you were here on earth. That's kind of new to some people. God is going to judge you about your money, Brother Bright. Money is going to be part of the things in God's judgmental item on that day. So God is very particular about what you do with your money. And now, we were discussing something today. You begin to wonder people who will use their money to buy pornographic stuff. <laughs> oh, church. People who will use their money to to, to, to go to buy drugs. Am I communicating, church? People who use the resources, the material resources, is, is from God. The Bible says that the, the thousand cattle on the hill belongs to who? Belongs to God. People who will use their money to buy liquors and stage parties and sex and all kinds of things. This is not theirs. This is something that they could have used to advance this kingdom work. This is something that they could have helped to use to finance the work of God in church. If not just even church, even in society, there are the less privileged. There are people who are suffering, who are struggling, who have no food. Some of this money could have been apportioned to help these people reach their potentials. It could have been even used to sponsor a child in school, to pay for a health care, to do something. So that's why God says that even when the Son of Man comes, part of the things that God is going to use to judge you is money. So the socioeconomic metrics that measure poverty, as we know it today in America, include healthcare. Most of you here are in healthcare. Now, if you don't have health insurance, what happens when you get to hospital? They kind of just do one quacky quacky treatment like that. <laughs> and what happens the next hour or two? They send you home. Done. All right? And I've seen people who sued emergency room. Emergency room was supposed to be what it is, emergency room. But most of them didn't have insurance. They kept them there for 24 hours. That's poverty church. There are so many resources going around in this country that can be used. God is going to judge America. And God is going to judge us, not just as individuals, as a church, as a community, even as a nation. There are so many people that have so much wealth. But because of the spirit of poverty, they cannot feel free to release in the hand of God and see what God will do with it. So healthcare is one of the things that we use today to look at our physical well-being. Access to health, affordability of healthcare, health insurance, nutrition, infant mortality, sanitation, educational attainment, access to good drinking water, shelter, and some of these other socio-economic uh, metrics that we use in public health and nursing and science and whatever. How do we know that a community is healthy? It's when they have good roads, good road networks. Not when you drive your fine car that I coveted this morning, you meant to that? <laughs> and then that pothole will eat the car. And then you can pass through. That's part of the poverty we're talking about. Why will you, why will a people like me in Nigeria have to suffer? Why will somebody suffer in Nigeria? Nobody should have suffered in that country. 
In fact, the IMOF said that beginning from 1960 when they get independence to 2010, 400 billion US dollars has been squandered by the political class. It cannot be accounted. 400 billion. I didn't say million, I said billion. That's a problem. That's the spirit of poverty that must be broken. Finally, Webster Dictionary provides one of the most accurate definitions of poverty. And it says that poverty is a state of one who lacks a usual or socially acceptable amount of money or material possessions to live well. Is that true or false? That's true. When you cannot pay your bills, when the children cannot go to school, when your life cannot achieve its goal while you're still here on earth waiting for Jesus' return, you are poor. That's the problem. And God has a problem with that. A majority of us are poor not because we should be poor, but because our mentors were poor, so they infected us with what I call a DNA of poverty. Some of our parents were poor. They didn't understand that they can do better than that, that there is a better stuff that can be done with money. The church was poor. They didn't understand the concept of material, well-being, money, and all these things, and put them together to empower. By the way, God said dominate, rule. All these natural resources, the material resources, everything that God, God said rule, dominate, have power, have authority, gas and oil. All of these things were God given natural resources to make your life meaningful why you're still here on earth. We didn't understand those concepts. So we go to church and we fail to teach about money. We go to church, we fail to empower the young people. We go to church, people, we just tell them that once you can get to school, if you can just get a degree, if you can get a PhD, you'll be well. But I beg to tell you that that is not the case. I have had to see so many PhD people who are janitors in this country. There are so many, if, if having a PhD was the shortest way for you to walk away from poverty, why is it that many of the professors that taught us in school are just few paychecks away from losing their house? Ever thought about that? Why is it that pharmacists, doctors, just six months, no job, one year, they are out on the street? Why, if going to school, getting all the PhDs, was all it takes for you to walk away? It's in the mind, it's a spirit that some of us how to conquer and overcome and become the best that God wants us to be. I once read an, an article where a man says, if you want to make waves, go to Harvard and get your PhD. But if you want to make wealth, get a GED. That's all you need, amen? That's all. Get a GED and you make serious wealth. People like Steve Jobs of Apple Computers, drop out, be good. Did he, did he, doesn't have a degree even as I speak to you today. But I have first degree. I had a master's, and then I did another master's degree, and I'm doing it. Oh, God help me. And some of you, they dump in school and give you MBA after. I mean, come on, George, the nutritionist and all kind of, you're just starting me. I mean, George, oh, God. Poverty. If you don't have two, how can you give out one? If you don't have something, it's so difficult. Some people will even have the spirit to give up, but because they don't have it, that's why the church is struggling. The community, our families. So what God is saying today is that you must kill that identity of poverty. It is poverty, uh, the spirit of poverty is an identity. It's a self-image that constantly creates a sense of lack. It creates a sense of lack. Is a spirit that we must kill. And I've seen people that even, who have even small, but because of this sense of lack, they can feel free to release in the hand of God and watch God perform the impossible. Poverty creates a sense of lack. Even when you don't necessarily lack. It makes you to believe that giving is losing. Poverty spirit makes us to believe that it is better for us to receive than to give. But what did Jesus do? The Bible says that he left his splendor from heaven. He knew his destiny. He knew everything he had to go through, but he gave his life for you. That is what God wants you to begin to do, to give, to invest, to recreate wealth, to use the resources, the material resources 
that is still within your disposal. There are so many things you can do. And over this month of May, I'm going to teach on this pulpit serious principles of financial wealth creation, how you can break away from the spirit of poverty, how you're going to be banished from poverty forever. As I keep teaching here, I've told a number of you that I will never be poor in the mighty name of Jesus. My offspring, my generation, we will live to finance this work of the kingdom. We will go to places with God if Jesus still tarries to come with the serious wealth that God is going to give us. But it begins to determine mind to believe that yes, if Jesus can give his own life, that there is still much you are not doing that you can do for this gospel of the kingdom. Remember that he said that the kingdom of God is like an investor. You need to invest. You need to trust God. Investing his work is a kingdom work. The work we are doing is not carnal. It's a spiritual work. But there is the material part of it that we cannot get past unless we touch money. My prayer is that the same way that Jesus came and died and gave the best gift there was that some of us will begin to find a spot in our lives where we will kill the spirit of poverty whether it is one dollar or two that God has given to us that judiciously like the wise servant will invest to go forward with who God has called us to be I pray that every spirit of poverty every spirit of sense of lack that has been holding you back from investing into what God, from sowing to reap a harvest of what God has promised about your life, that by the time we finish this series, people will be liberated. Many people will have money in this church. I thought I would hear amen to that. Many people's family will change. Your situation will change. Some of you, I'm not going to charge you my consultation fee for taking you through step to step what you can do. Simple things that I believe people who are seated in this church today can implement and by December, some of them will come back to me and say, Pastor, I've started to reap my money. Apart from your regular job, I'm telling you, B, you can do it. Afuya, I trust that by the special grace of God, you can be working in that office. And when you come back, you open an account and just check how much money you have made while you were working somewhere else. And sometimes, who knows, my brother may even Quit that thing he called a job. <laughs> Amen. Say no more. Okay. <laughs> Amen. And sin no more in that office that he called an office. And do. I know you have a big heart for God. As what you sing music, deep concert, and that kind of thing. I know you like God. There are so much you can do. But what is keeping you down is that office that you're going Monday to Friday. You don't have much time on your hand to do a lot of things you want to do for God. You're going in that office, like I said, because your boss is in charge of your life, and then because money is still controlling your life and my life. My prayer is that God will make you the boss. The Bible says that you will not be the tail, but that you will be the hell. So feel free in the presence of Jesus this month to come back. As we continue on this series, the Bible says, cast your bread upon the waters, and after many days, what happens? It will come back to you. Give, and it will come back to you. Good measures, press that, shaking together, running over. God will bless you as you believe his word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.